So we move from Thursdays to Wednesdays. And um, today is October 4th, and I'd like to call the order the, uh, the meeting. So the first item of business we have today or is twofold uh, to review the uh, September 7th meeting minutes and decision letters. It's customary for us to review those together and uh, introduce a motion approving or modifying or rejecting. Uh, them together in one. So I'll give the committee members a few moments to do that so we can publicly review those items. And one item I want to bring to the commission's attention, because we had preliminary approvals for many of our cases last time, the conditions are actually not set forth in the decision letter. So it's very important that those conditions are clear in the minutes. So um, the preliminary approval, they can go back and look to those minutes to understand the conditions. Go ahead, Logan. And there was a uh, change to our August minutes, which Michael will have up on the screen, that was requested at the last meeting. I think it was just in the first part. It said August minutes instead of July minutes. Correct. That, but, that did get changed. I just wanted to let you know. Let's go. Let's go back to Miss um, Simpson's note about the case that had a preliminary approval i think that was metro water services is uh, that correct the last three cases there was there the um, yep yeah the metro Which, water the basswood and the um i can't think of the last one or the saint joseph school those three were preliminary so these is it, conditions are listed in the minutes but not the decision letters and that was customary with typical process that's what's an ask that that's customary that, that's okay with you I think that that makes sense. Um, one of the things, and Terry, you can let me know if this is going outside of Robert's rules of order. There are a couple of items before I put forth a motion that I wanted to just confirm with the commission that our, um, that our conditions are clear. Um, so tell me if that's appropriate now or if I would need to make a motion and then open up the floor for discussion. For the minutes? For the minutes. No, there's no motion on the table. Great, I'll entertain a motion. Second. What about when Kabir and I recuse ourselves on one of the cases? Now we've only got three people to discuss it. Do you need a quorum for approval of minutes? You have to have a quorum to take any official action. I think Ms. Janie Camp was going to be late this morning, so maybe we can push this item to the end of our agenda and revisit it. Good point, Mr. Fulmer. So why don't we table this conversation and um, we could approve, well, let's go ahead and wrap it all up in one. I was going to take it case by case, but at this point it may be more efficient to just take it to the end. Or, um, I, I think that would make the most sense in light of the conditions being in the minutes. So I think it would make sense to do them together, Agreed. in my opinion. Okay, wonderful. So motion and a second. Um, you want to withdraw your motion at this point? I just seconded the discussion. Motion to, we have, well, I'll withdraw the motion to discuss. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and I'll make a motion to move it to the end of the meeting. You brought up good discussion within your motion to necessitate withdrawing your motion. <laughs> that was that was an effective use of Robert's rules orders. I, I will second this motion. <laughs> all right. Any other discussion? Great. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carries. Great. We will table the uh, approval of the minutes and the decisions letters for the last item on our agenda, and we will now move forward into the cases um, just let's see we have two cases today I believe uh, the first case on the agenda uh, is a revisit from our last meeting in September Logan uh, is, is the applicant here uh, they're not here for that case but yeah they want to defer another 30 days if possible okay they are going to change their plans uh, it's my understanding but they've got to go through board of zoning appeals and things like that so okay we have to have a motion. 
motion here. Motion. We have second. a motion and then properly seconded by Mr. Former. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Great. Second case on the agenda today, the, the two of two. Uh, if the applicant would come up to the podium here and I will brief you on the way that this works. Uh, typically we give, uh, come up to the front here, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, so the way this goes down is, yes, is that um, um, Logan will read you your rights related to appealing the case. He will then introduce the case. We will open up the presentation for you to present. That's a 10 minute presentation. I'll give you a two minute warning. Um, I won't count the introductions against you. And uh, at that point, we will close your presentation, open it up to uh, public comment or any letters we may have received. We will close public comment. Then the committee will deliberate and we may have some follow-up questions for you and then we'll carry it to vote. Did I miss anything? I think so. Great, okay. Opening statements to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Stormwater Management Commission, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the commission's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Case number two on the agenda, case 2023-00013, 700 Height Street at 700 Height Street. APN is 0911001900. Inspector is Kimberly Hayes. Council District 20, Roland Horton. Applicants request allowance of an existing deck to remain in the floodway buffer, continuous mowing and maintenance of portions of the stream buffer, relocation of buffer signage is necessary, modification of buffer signage, one sign proposed is educational. Appellant is Joseph Clay and Lauren Ellens Bromfield, represented by Clayton Lanehart, Bevel Construction. Comments, stormwater staff defer to recommendation of stormwater management commission. Codes, no comment provided. Planning, defer to recommendation of the stormwater management commission. Greenways, defer to recommendation of the stormwater management commission. Wonderful. If you wouldn't mind, please uh, introduce everyone that's at the podium and press the button that's at the base of the mic so that it's recording. I'm Clayton Lanehart, uh, general contractor with Bevel, um, representing uh, Lauren and Joseph today. <laughs> I'm Joseph Bromfield. I'm one of the homeowners. Lauren Ellens Bromfield, the other homeowner. <laughs> I want to start off, thank you guys for your time today. Let us come present in front of you. Um, we're going to present um, an application to get a variance so that um, the Brumsfells can add a second floor addition to the property. The reason we're here for you, in front of you today is because there were some existing violations of the um, regulations that were present when the Brumsfells bought the home. And since they bought it, they've been in communication with Logan to try and figure out how to rectify those so they could add an addition. They're looking to um, expand their family. Um, so we want them to be able to stay in their house um, and not have to move. Um, so that's why they're looking for the addition. So we're trying to figure out a solution to how do we get the property as close to um, compliant as possible um, and possibly a variance to allow a couple things to go through so that we can build an addition. Um, the Brumsfields can stay in the house and not have to move out of the neighborhood. Um, they purchased the home in 2020 and in uh, shortly after that started reaching out to Logan because uh, they were considering doing some modifications to the house and realized that um, the basement was not up to the correct flood elevation. So through some conversations with him in the basement, um, it is it basically needs to, we need to infill, um, I think it's like nine inches of part of the basement to get it up to the correct flood elevation, which we plan on doing as part of this project. So that's kind of the first violation that was there that we need to correct. As um, we started to look at the property, we quickly realized that with the um, buffers that are in place and the setbacks and the easements, there was really no room to take any addition out the back of the house, as you can see. Um, there's basically nothing there. The, when they, the house was purchased, the entire rear yard was being mowed. Um, so it was not maintained as um, native species. And then there was a deck that was present that was built by the previous owner that was also there. So um, after talking with Logan and trying to figure out kind of a plan forward, we quickly realized that going up um, with a second story addition was really the only way we could add square footage to the home um, in a way that didn't interact with um, either of the buffers. 
But in doing that, we realized that we would need to rectify some of the things that were um, happening on the property, such as the mowing. Um, there was a gravel drive, which is existing on the side of the house, which does go back into um, the buffer. Um, and then there was the deck that was there. Um, so Logan, I don't know if you have um, maybe one of our, the plan that was submitted um, by any chance. Yeah, if you go to maybe that page, um, no, nope, go to the next page if you don't mind. Um, so this is kind of our proposed plan. Um, so what we would like to do uh, for, and, and I'm sorry, this is actually, um, go, Logan, go to all the way to maybe the um, second to last page in the presentation, because that's got the um, landscaping plan in it as well. Oh, nope, sorry, go up, keep going, yep, oh, right there. <laughs> um, scroll, I think it's up, Logan, and I'm sorry. Ahead. I know, geez, up, down, left, right, spin it around, upside down. He's doing over there. You're driving. I'm sorry. I thought it was Logan. Sorry, I'm doing. Yeah, it's Logan. It's Logan. It's Logan. It's Logan. Yeah. Go one one more page up if you don't mind. Just there you go. Right here. Okay. So this is our landscaping plan. So um, this is the proposed plan um, that we uh, hope to do. Um, uh, we like to present in front of y'all. Um, we'd also like to ask that if there's anything in here that you see that um, you would like to change, we're really here to look for a solution to this. So this is a proposed plan. We would love to be able to um, proceed with this plan. However, the real goal of our um, being here today is to try and make sure that we can get this project done. So our proposal um, and the, the request of the variance is that um, we be able to continue to mow a portion of the rear yard. So as you see, all along the fence line um, in the very back of the property, which is in buffer number one, um, we would like to replant um, half of that um, buffer um, with native species and let it go unmaintained. We would maintain a 50% uh, portion of that as being mowed um, so that they can have room for um, a dog that they have as well as their children to play. Um, we then, in buffer number two, uh, we would like to continue to mow that buffer, um, but we would propose that we would remove the, all of the gravel drive that is existing in that buffer. So completely remove that, replace with sod. Um, and then the deck that is existing in that buffer, we would like to maintain that as well. Um, the third request we had was um, we would move any signage um, that is necessary and place it along both buffers for the no mow um, conditions. And then there is an existing doghouse which is placed in buffer number one, which we would move um, out of the buffer um, and place that uh, in the rear yard. So the addition that we plan to do, you can see it outlined on this plan in the dashed line that's existing over the top of the house, yep, right there. Um, it will not um, enter into either um, buffer and no footers or anything like that will um, enter in there. So we're actually not looking to disturb any land as part of this project. We're actually looking to reclaim as much as possible back to as close as we can, we feel like we can get to um, be in compliance with um, regulation. So, um, so this is the plan we've come up with, um, with our landscape architect, um, with the Brumsfields, with myself. Um, and would like to let them make any comments um, that they may have on the project, but that's just kind of a download on, on what we're trying to do today. Um, thank you, Clayton, very, very well said. Our, our goal really is just to find a, a solution to stay. We like our neighbors, we like our street, we like being close to England Park and being close to school, we're, we're teachers, so it's important for us to be able to during lunch, if we need to get home, be able to get home is really important to us. And so that's why we're really trying to find a solution to stay and still be responsible stewards of this neighborhood along the Richland Creek area. And this is our first home. So we moved from Virginia for our teaching jobs and being able to move during 2020, our neighbors have been so wonderful for us. Um, and we expected this home to be, oh, it'll be our first home and then we'll move elsewhere. And we love it. We love where we are, and we are ready to start a family, but we do need more space to do that and to be able to stay within a short distance from our schools. Um, we both teach at different schools, but in the same area. It's really, really, really important to us, um, both for our family and for getting back and forth for our students. Um, so that's really what it's about. We just want to be able to stay where we are and have enough space where we can stay there forever if we want to. Great. Thank, Thank you for that presentation. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I think that's it. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll close the presentation, open it up for public comment. Is there anybody here to speak in favor of or opposition of this? Okay. Logan, did we receive any letters or 
as Chair Galbraith likes to mention, blimps or airmail or <laughs> smoke signals. <laughs> there is nothing on this case. Okay. All right. We'll close the public hearing then and open it up for the committee for discussion. And I'd like to start it off by uh, making sure we're clear on the three components of this request. I think there were three, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, one is the existing uh, back deck to remain within the zone two buffer. That's right. Right. Uh, number two was uh, mowing a portion of the zone one buffer and, or excuse me, mowing the zone two buffer and landscaping uh, portion of the zone one buffer. And just to clarify that, the zone one buffer, we we would like to, to take 50% of it and go back to unmaintained. So um, not, okay. it's not say landscaped, but go back to an unmaintained status and then um, have about 50% of that zone one be a mode landscaped portion of zone one. So trying to get as much of that zone one back to being fully unmaintained. So it's the shaded area, it would be the- That's right, the kind of right area. along the fence line. Mm -hmm. and and then, then, In the zone two. That's correct, yes. So. And that is not a, that's not a specific request to remove the gravel, but we're doing that as part of this um, application. I, can, I mean, I can make some clarification on the violations, I guess, well, that he mentioned if you, after you're done. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to, before we got to the violation piece, how, how we got here is that did the 50% rule not come into play here where the value of the renovation is? So. The, the home was raised after 2010, so that's before the before the Brownfields bought it. It was raised due to substantial damage to the house mm -hmm. for flooding. Um, and so the buffer did not technically trigger then. We don't usually trigger those on a substantial damage. They are triggering it with this because of the 50% value. So the value of the renovation is 50% above the <coughs> value of the home? The appraised value. The, the appraised value of the home. So they, is that correct? The buffer is really be, being triggered by this construction. Okay. <clears throat> the, the base the work that they're doing is not within the buffer. The yeah, it's not, not within the buffer, yeah. That's correct. But it is part of the construction you were required to reestablish the zone one and two? Yeah, and if they didn't have any impervious area within the buffer, at all, then we wouldn't make them come to, to you guys. We just approve it at a staff level. But they're not adding a new driveway. Yeah, the decks, the, the decks, the existing, what's existing in the buffer. What's, if they were removing the deck, and, the, what, and there might be a portion of the house that's in the zone two, I guess. If they were taking those off, then we could do it at staff level and just let them mow half of the zone one. They, they treat it like a brand new construction to the 50%. There's a policy for, yeah, there's a policy for infill sites that allows you to, to mow half of the zone one buffer as well without coming to the commission. Can I make a clarification on the appraised value? So the appraised value was just over $400,000 current appraised value of the home. The um, addition will be less than 125000 So we the So, yeah, we are not at 50%. Uh, the addition, the modifications are not uh, over 50% of the of, um, appraised value of the home. So I do want to clarify that. We need to explore that a little bit further, I feel. Well, I guess well, it's at a private appraisal or the public? It's, it's the oh, sorry, that's a private appraisal based on like a, um, this is not, it is not from the city, I guess, the like tax assessor's um, value. Is that what, is that the clarification? Yeah, the, the city breaks it into land and then improvement. Understood. And, and it's private appraisals never do, but there's a lot of times that we've been able to work with the land shown on the appraisal and back out of the private appraisal. Understood. I've had several projects where the city recognizes the private appraisal. Just, um, okay. So what what was the construction value? We don't have an exact number yet, but it'll be under 125,000. So if you want to put 115 per item. And on, the, the city's got 112,000 is the land. And so you could either consider it as the percentage, 112 over 280, or you could say the land is accurate um, and, and subtract that out of the private appraisal for that consideration. No, no in the. <clears throat> that'd be my typical process is to just take the private appraisal and then subtract the land that the property assessor has. And, and in that case, they wouldn't trigger the 50 and they wouldn't even be here. Is the the finish the basement finished floor raising? Is that just due to 
minimum finish floor in floodplain? Yeah, so you can't, you're not supposed to have a basement. It was missed when we originally inspected the house and it was caught. I think it was probably caught in about 2019 by a community rating system when we submitted the elevation certificates. Mm -hmm. And so we reached out to the Bromfields when they bought it and we've been in contact since 2020 to kind of get that piece resolved. So that's a finished basement? It's not finished, no. It's unfinished. It's a storage, but the floor of the basement, it's got two sections. So one is kind of at grade and one's lower. And the lower portion is what they're going to have to fill in. And mm -hmm. just a few inches. Okay. And it was that like that when they purchased it? It was like that when they purchased it, yeah. It was a mystery to us. It but. was, yeah. <laughs> that, that is the way it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to but, not have to do um, more than you're absolutely required to if there's a provision that allows you to be grandfathered in, in this case, based on the 50% rule. Um, so there's there's really three triggers. It's 50% of the appraised value, adding more than 25% of the current floor area to the house. So I don't know if they'd be triggering that. It's Do possibly. you know if y'all trigger that, the square footage being added? Uh, I, so if we actually look at that um, table right there, we are... Actually, that's just house footprint, isn't it? It doesn't actually call square footage. I think we are adding more than 25% square footage. I'm pretty certain. Yeah, pretty so certain. That, that may be the trigger. But the part being added, the construction being added, is not in any of the areas. that mean anything at all? Well, to, to, to Trey's point, um, your addition, just, just in, in the ISO view, is not necessarily the entire footprint of the first floor plate, no. or is it? No. It's not. It's not. So it's less than um, it's less than the first floor, nine hundred seventy-five square feet. I think is what I saw. Yeah, it's. I think it's right about. We're adding about. We're adding a, about half as much of the first floor up top. So. And will the deck remain? Or is there going to be any construction on the deck? Part of the addition will come on to the existing deck. Um, so the deck will remain as is, but we'll actually take over part of it. But the portion we're taking over is not in the buffer. Um, and we, it's possible we have one footer that has to be um, dug and poured. There's a note on, the, on one of these pages about it, but that footer will not be inside the buffer. So that's 25%. <clears throat> the, what, what I'm, the way the stormwater manual reads is floor area. I don't know if that's, that, I don't know if there's a definition. Yeah. I'm not sure if there's a definition anywhere. Because if there's a basement, that's a storage basement, and it's accessible. If it's not hitting the code, you can't. I, I, yeah, I don't know if that was space. Yeah. Do you know what you're well, but if it's just floor area, that, uh, 960. If it's just like written as floor area, I'm not sure how that, like if that means occupied or not, mm -hmm. unconditioned or not. It could right. go either way. I'll be able to tell you in a second. <laughs> Obviously, this is a very benign application, and we're trying to make yeah. sure that other applicants can't use a decision on this against us. <laughs> I hear that. So I don't see a definition of floor area, but there's just a definition of floor. Well, flood-related erosion area, or flood-related erosion-prone area, but not flood, not floor area. There's, there's really two things. It's, it's one, when somebody has a hardship, then we can easily approve it. And the second one is if you're increasing the or enhancing the stream buffer, then it, we're a little bit, we can be more lenient on the actual hardship. And by removing the driveway, you are. Leaving the deck, I mean, that's not, uh, you're, you're, you're kind of trading off the enhancement of the perimeter buffer and removing the driveway, in my opinion. But I'm also curious if 
definition of floor area um, under the zoning code, if you can count the basement, then you'd be under the 25%. Yeah, Because it seems like you're probably 35%. Yes. Right now. Which, that's right. So if you do 600 feet instead of 900 feet, then you, we get no enhancement to the buffer. And that doesn't, you know, because you don't have to comply. And so that just does. Find it as area under roof. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it it uh um, it, it says floor area means the total gross horizontal areas of all floors, including usable basements and cellars, okay. below the roof and within the outer surfaces of the main walls of principal or accessory buildings. Um, That's pretty so specific. Yeah. So I, I was saying, this is a it's a full height basement, it's eight foot eight foot ceiling essentially. So. I mean, it, it, per the zoning code. That counts, and I think that if th th it's not a mistake, really, on anybody's other than I know that y'all just aren't as used to research and zoning codes. And I think if we could have had all that information up front, you might not be here. Understood. But and yeah. That, so oh. how do we handle that then? So that that's. Um, let me ask one, are you using the basement area for storage? Is it in use right now? In storage for sure. Okay. Yeah. We can submit, not, we for can the submit. definition, I don't even know if it matters that they're using it. Yeah. Mr. Hunt, you seem like you've got something on your mind. Um, I guess I had one question for Logan. Are they going to have to sign the basement agreement that it won't be finished as part of this project? Yes. Uh, that would be a non-conversion agreement, and it will go and file with the deed to say... Okay. It can't be the, the other thing I was going to mention, maybe as a suggestion, seems to be some question about what kicks us in. Uh, obviously, it, it seems to me that it was deemed it needed a single-family residential permit, which would have necessitated implementing the buffer. That's how our policies and regs generally work. That's how we make back over time and regain the buffers. Um, if a site doesn't need a variance, it can be permitted and go forward. So if there is some question as to whether or not this actually did, uh, di did or does need a variance, you could perhaps go ahead and hear the case on its merits, decide if it is deemed to need a permit, whether you would grant a variance, and then with a recommendation to staff to review if a permit is indeed needed given the considerations. That way you could cover both bases, whether it needed a permit or not, and just to make sure staff verifies that it did indeed need a buffer variance. So just a suggestion. I mean, a, a single family permit's only required if you're increasing impervious area by 700 <clears throat> square feet. Yeah, I'd say they probably didn't need that in this case. I think that, I thought the trigger was the floor area, but it ended personally. It would have been, you just yeah. didn't have the information you needed. Yeah. And y'all didn't know to provide that you could count the basement. So. Yeah, agreed. So we'll turn away towards a motion. I, I'll make a motion to a, a approve as submitted if a variance is indeed required. Second. The, any discussion on that? Is that do, we, do we need to add the second piece about the the permit or any language that Mr. Hunt? I I would I would say I don't think it needs to be added to the motion. But the thought behind that is they can resubmit calculations for the basement, for the floor area. And if they can present the private appraisal, then Logan can use standard practice to assess if the dollar value exceeds. Right. And if the dollar value exceeds, then you know, they don't necessarily have to come back to us, but they could implement the plan. But yeah, and, and so, they, they necessarily would not necessarily have to do what's on this plan. That we're approving. If if a variance isn't required, then we can't require any of it. We would highly encourage you to. <laughs> 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 but the reality is, it, if it doesn't trigger, it doesn't. Correct. We're, we have no authority. Yeah, that's right. Does is that in relation to the basement modification as well as you understand it, or is it just the backyard pieces that we've talked about today? If, if the basement is two is lower than the minimum elevation, elevation, I would rely on 
staff to review that. I don't know if you don't need a permit. I don't know if you can be forced to bring it up to code. Uh, I would. There's a we'll need a building permit to do the addition. Right. So I would imagine that stormwater would have a review of that based on correct a plat application. Okay. Just wanted to verify. That's it. I, I was just wanted to ask about the buffer signage. If it looks like. They've got educational signage proposed. If you had any thoughts on having a buffer sign in the yard, if they need a variance, of course, that would be necessitated if they had if they needed a variance. I would presume. You just didn't put that in your conditions. I didn't know if, if you prefer them to have a buffer sign or what your thoughts were. Is it in the request? I think this is a quasi deferral in some form, but we're providing a motion now such that it can move forward if it does not require a variance. Is what I'm hearing. Meaning, um, yeah. So I think the I think if if it does move forward because it does trigger a variance for some reason, we need to be sure that we have all the conditions clearly outlined in this motion. We have to evaluate as if it does require a variance, and then if it doesn't, then everything goes away. That's right. So that's what Logan's saying is like, how do we feel about the buffer signage? Do we want one? Like, do we feel like they need one or not? Because if we do think that it needs to go in there, it needs to be in the conditions. Yeah, I don't, well, they can go back on their own and recalculate and, re, and resubmit to the permitting authority mm -hmm. and remove this necessity, right? But if they don't do that, or if they do that and it gets complicated, we would have already approved this variance is the way I'm going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah right. Logan's quite, they're asking to not have a sign. They're, they're asking yeah. to put a sign up, yeah, you know, make it educational, but I didn't know if you yeah. wanted to that's accept that. That's, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. A single educational sign is more than, I, I would fully support that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, Jay, is your, your motion to approve it as, as presented? To, to recap, the motion is to approve as submitted if a variance is indeed required. Yeah, I'll second on that. Great. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Any abstains? None. Motion carries. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yeah, that's what I, I actually had uh, kind of advised Janie not to come because I thought it would be a short meeting. So, as long as we can do we mine without me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We got, well, yeah. We've got four. Yeah, we can do all of them except for okay. mine. We. I mean, we all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, I, I I think we could do the decision letters. I am questioning whether you could break up the minutes themselves, if if that makes sense. Um, we can approve them. Though. Well, I think what he's saying. Well, I, I think you can make a motion to remove the minutes for from that one case and have them documented on the following months. I mean, none of the cases had like precedent. They were all preliminaries or a deferral, so it's there's not a case waiting for a grading permit approval or something. That's right. They're Even all if we push anyway. it to November, it's really not. But, a big well, deal. so if a case, if the minutes aren't approved, can a case come back and submit for a final with, with without approved with minutes or decision have, letters? Uh, the comments I have on St. Joseph's School, there are a couple of little typos, but um, we were talking about the buffer signage. I'm pretty sure that we specifically wanted kiosks. That was a point of discussion, so I don't know if that would be important as a part of the conditions compared to a sign as, as it relates to a kiosk, because I think we talked about that for some time. The other issue that, not an issue necessarily, but when we were looking at the proposal from Metro Government, um, about the stream relocation, we had a lot of discussion about the mitigation. <clears throat> and I believe that we had talked about having something in hand. There, there was discussion on that, and I'm not sure if it's captured necessarily in the current language in the minutes. Related to the compensatory mitigation Correct. strategy. <clears throat> so those were, yeah. those were the two things that I wanted to discuss, especially since our decision letters don't have the conditions. It's the minutes that outlines those. So why don't we, since these are both preliminary approvals, have those items addressed and bring them back up for approval in our next meeting if there's nothing pressing on this. 
on these two cases, they're both preliminary approvals. That way we can have it all amended and we have everybody here to make a vote. Yeah, I would just like to know if that will affect the applicant's ability to submit for a final variance. If they're submitting for this next month, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously, like, yeah. if they submit for October's deadline, they wouldn't be heard until December. So will it hold up the submittal or will it potentially hold up just being heard at the December meeting? Because they wouldn't have, be able to submit for a November meeting, which Approved. is when these would be approved. Uh, in my opinion, it's already as been we do the minutes at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, right, right. They could still be heard. It's just at risk, albeit at a very small risk because it's just a sign. I mean, there's no requirement to have a preliminary variance before you have a final variance. Anyway, that's true. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. In this case, they just chose to go the preliminary route first. They could have just come in with preliminary. That's right. Rights. That's true, yeah. Got deferred. That's right. Or got denied. And again, it, others may not be as concerned about those items. I'm kind of learning the process. So, um, But in the interim, I'm happy to, to go back and obviously watch the video to, to look at those discussions again. Um, and I think I'd be in a better position to be prepared for a motion for any sort of um, mm -hmm. potential amendments to the, the current minutes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important that the, the conditions are clear or the, you know, the decision letters are clear because the, the purpose of the preliminary variance is to give as much direction as possible to the applicant. So um, we're not really doing the applicant any, any sort of favor if the, the decision letter is not clear. Mr. Hunt, can you scroll down on the screen you have in front of you related to the Omohundro expansion? I see the comments. Um, there it is, number two at the top of the page. So I think that was addressing your question, Ms. Simpson, on if the proposal for offsite mitigation is not accepted by federal, state, or local agencies, and their proposal for onsite mitigation or offsite within Davidson County shall be proposed with the final variance. So that's in the. Are you saying? That's in the <clears throat> Were you trying to say that you wanted that to be in hand before, or that that's? I believe there was, just, and that was a very long meeting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think we were we were getting into maybe the third hour at that point, but um, and I may be misremembering, but I believe that there were some concerns and discussions about what had happened in a previous matter mm -hmm. where, the it, yeah, it was the airport. Um, and I feel like there were discussions about additional conditions as it relates to that mitigation that may not be in the language. Um, you know, what? another approach in this case, since it is a preliminary, is Logan can remind them of that discussion in the meeting and make sure that they are, that they don't, when they have the pre-app for the final, um, if it were a <coughs> final variance, then. Yeah. We have the video. I mean, we can send them the video part too to actually see what. Because I, right. I didn't document everything that was said, but. Well, and I guess that, that is my question, um, and, and this is more of a discussion for the commission on the preliminary approvals. And this is, I believe, the first time I have looked at decision letters since I've been on the commission for the preliminary approvals. If you look at the language, it just talks about further described in the case record. Um, so I believe the case record, you're looking back at the minutes in part, uh, that could also include the video recording, but there's not actually conditions listed out in the decision letters, which is why I wanted to be as clear as possible in the minutes. Um, so that's just one thing I wanted to point out. And I think that that is, is common in a lot of it being a preliminary approval, but wanted to give as clear guidance as we possibly could in those minutes. I think that there's some unresolved issues to look at. So I think a deferral is pro or deferral of this is probably necessary as you guys are talking it through. Um, I th for the Roberts rules, there there are that's what I was sort of researching as you guys are talking. Um, it's sort of split like it, four is a, uh, you, you guys need four for a quorum, but your rules say you need a majority vote of members present. And so technically, if you recuse, you're still present. Um, so I think that we probably would have been OK from a quorum uh, perspective. But to me, it sounds like there's other things that need to be looked into and sort of tinkered with a little bit. So it's it's not a bad idea to just go ahead and defer at this point. It sounds like we have a motion that I can't make could a motion. Be, could be, could be proposed. <laughs> I motion to adjourn. <laughs> Well, um, and 
Commissioner McDonald, was your concern, I mean, I just want to make sure the concern that you brought up that we've kind of circled back to that. Does everybody feel comfortable with a deferral? I'm happy to make the motion just to be safe, you know. No, I think, I think a deferral is most appropriate just with how many items are outstanding or that we're still talking about. Okay. Right. Well, Jenny's about 20 minutes out if we want to. Well, we just learned that we don't think that we need a quorum in order to approve minutes, just a majority of those present. Well, you well, you're would count as a quorum if you're still in the room. You need a quorum. You just... But if you don't have to have four for a quorum. Is it the quorum the majority of those present, or is it... The so the, the quorum meeting. is still in the meeting. The quorum is still in the meeting. What I'm saying is, is even if you recuse, if you still have four warm bodies in the room... You still have a quorum, so the majority of those present would pass a motion. Oh, we'd God. send you in the corner over there. Yeah, yeah. you can still be here. Yeah. 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 Votes. Exactly. Votes. You can't leave, but if you're sitting here, then technically we'll retain our quorum. Interesting. Makes sense. Just like an automatic no vote. <laughs> I would move to um, defer any sort of passing of the of the minutes and decision letters until next meeting. Second. So, probably seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chairman. Correct. Yes. If I might add one thing on this topic, one of the things maybe for some of the new members that we've seen over time is these two cases are on your mind right now because they were just last month. What in all likelihood will happen they won't come back for months. There'll be a lot of cases in the interim. So um, I do think it would be a good policy to outline exactly what the preliminary approval was based on because, and we do this all the time as staff, we document exactly what we're approving or not improving. If someone comes in and they're deemed to not need a permit, we document what their application showed so that if they eventually do or are found that they needed a permit, we can show, well, that's not what you applied for. So uh, maybe as you contemplate how you want this to, to be done going forward, uh, you can let staff know. But just be aware when these come back, you're probably going to, without a great deal of effort in going back and reviewing the, the video uh, or looking at the minutes or, or what, and it seemed like the minutes maybe were, was very succinct as far as what the conditions were. Just just keep in mind it might be efficient to have a delineation of exactly what the approval, preliminary approval was based on. You bring up a good point because we, what we may not want to put ourselves into is a position to where we're providing succinct and exact direction on a preliminary approval when it needs to be somewhat vague in nature because the concept of the overall plan is going to change and evolve in time. And so uh, right now we're treating it somewhat as if it was a case for approval, not necessarily a preliminary. So how do we document guidance between preliminary and actual approvals and how does that language or how does that direction from the commission need to be different from one or the other maybe is what you're yeah I think in on generally well. what the committees in the past have found themselves doing is has it changed enough since the last or changed to the degree that it's consistent with what was preliminary approved which is why you need the basis if that makes any sense so good to have that in a in a, mm -hmm. in a documented Wait. Isn't the issue, though, that the decision letter was not as specific as the meeting as minutes? Wasn't that the issue? They referred to the minutes, but an applicant would then have to dig them up and look at them and they just make a match. That would... Yeah, and, and they actually <coughs> refer to the case record, which well, I think would include the minutes and, yeah, it says the appellant is reminded that the decision of the commission is contingent upon the approval of the meeting minutes. And so the meeting minutes are, in essence, mm -hmm. I think part of the decision right. letter, but are, are half the applicants going back and reading the minutes. Yeah. But uh, I think when, when you're concerned, the fact that the minutes were more specific than the actual decision letter. So um, I think my concern is, like, normally the decision letters I saw, the conditions are outlined in the decision letter itself. And because it's preliminary, I think we cite back to the case record, including the meeting minutes. My concern was uh, that the meeting minutes, those conditions 
I, I was afraid it may have been missing some of the detail from our discussion and some of the actual conditions that were a part of the motion, like that exact language. So what, what was the guidance to fix that? I, I was... Do, uh, so, do we want to update the decision letters? To... Well, I, I didn't... I don't think I made any suggestion to update the decision letters. I think um, my suggestion was that we deferred um, any sort of approval of the meeting minutes, so have an opportunity to go back and be prepared for a motion for a potential amendment based off of uh, a couple of items that I would like to go back and watch the video to make sure that we have our appropriate condition language in the minutes. Okay. I think the hesitancy for me to put them in the decision letter especially on a preliminary specific conditions was for the applicant to think if I came in with these specific conditions met, then I'd automatically get approval. Yeah. I, I would think that you'd need to be very intentional about here's so. a, a potential summary, <laughs> but it's yeah. the applicant's okay. responsibility to refer back. And yeah, that's, that was my goal to minutes or minutes. Yeah. And some of the conditions were vague in some of the cases, you know, but some of them might have been a little bit more specific, like you're not going to have to have buffer signage. Well, if they came back 10 years later, that, that case had already been through a preliminary. The St. Joseph's case had already been through a preliminary 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And the next time it was heard as a final, different commission members who could might not be here might feel differently. They might want buffer signage. And we recently had a larger conversation about the slogan, right, about preliminary and Really, I guess the caution with those decision letters is that a preliminary is not a decision by the commission. A preliminary is just guidance. So we're not issuing a formal decision. Yes, if you come back exactly like this, we'll do it. It's more of a, here's guidance when you come back from your, with your final and we feel like it sort of looks like this based on what we've, what we've given you, then we will issue a decision on whether it's approved or not. And so, I, f I feel like you have to be very careful with the language on a preliminary because really it's just them like picking your brains, right? Mm -hmm. And you're not giving a decision because it could something could change in the interim and they could come back with a very similar plan and we don't necessarily want to be stuck with that. Um, so you have to kind of distinguish the two a little bit, if that makes sense, um, and just be a little more cautious about, like it's not approved, right? It's just you're picking our brains, we're giving you a recommendation of what we think it should look like. And that's where the reference back to the case file I think is important, so it's a holistic view of yeah. what's in it from a, pre from a preliminary approval standpoint and not just these specific bullet points, which would be what we do for final approvals. Now, that might, this has been very helpful, so I'm yeah, it's learning as, as, we, as we go along, but I, I appreciate it. I look forward to discussing it again in our next meeting in November. Any other items to discuss? Great, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Seconded. In favor, aye. 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 All right, everybody. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.